help of heaven now, I pray. Giving thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. David's running again. First verse of this chapter that we've read together, we find that he is fleeing. And so his troubles aren't over. And yet as David flees once again, he escapes the clutches of Saul. It becomes very evident that whilst he is able, with God's help, to escape the bloodthirsty purposes of Saul, there's something that David can't and isn't able to run away from. There's something that follows him. There's something that he can't escape because it is in him. And the thing that he can't escape are those questions that he expresses in verse 1. What have I done? What is mine iniquity? And what is my sin before thy father that he seeketh my life? What have I done? In one way, that's a, a very important question. It's a very important question for each one of us tonight to ask with respect to God. So David's asking it with respect to Saul. But I wonder, have you ever asked that question about yourself in relation to Almighty God? What have I done? What is my iniquity? What is my sin? What is my sin before God that he seeketh my life? Those are good questions for you to ask before God tonight because there is a reality to that. There is a certainty that we have sinned against God. And you could think of the prodigal son as he returns to the father's house and he has come to an awareness that he didn't have before that he has sinned against heaven, he says, and against you. And he's speaking to his father. And David, when he is made aware of his sin and he confesses his sin in Psalm 51 and he says, against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. And so I ask you tonight, in light of God's word, have you ever considered what you have done before God and what your sin is? Because we have sinned, this is the thing, we have all sinned, but what we do as sinners is we try to ignore that, we try to overlook it, we try to pretend that it hasn't happened or we excuse it so that it's not as serious as it actually is. But I, I trust tonight and I trust that God would have mercy in each one of us especially if you're not yet saved, and you would have that seriousness and that uh, awareness tonight uh, that you would ask those questions before God. What have I done? What is my sin? Make sure that you understand your sin before God and that it is acknowledged and that it is confessed and that it is repented of and that you turn to God. But David is asking these questions in, in a way that they are haunting him. We, we get the sense that he's disturbed. His, his spirit is disquieted within him. He's not a man at peace. And in the previous chapter, as he escapes from one threat and snare and attempt of Saul, and he escapes and he escapes and he escapes again, we get the idea that He's not suffering in that emotional or mental way. Uh, he, he escapes and things seem to fall down into a, a, a pattern of quietness again. Uh, and we don't get the sense that he's disturbed in mind. And ultimately he goes to Naioth to Ramah. Samuel's there. Samuel speaks to him. He hears the word of God. He hears the praise of God. And it's good for his soul. But he's running again and... Now we see something new. And it, it's disturbing to, to read that he's got this agitation and he's got these questions. And yet, it's, it's useful for us because at times we have questions. And uh, with things that happen in our lives, recent events and 
at other times in our lives, we, we've got those questions, why? Why did something happen? Why are things happening? And why me? We have questions about uh, perhaps where is life taking me? Where, where are things going to, to go from here? Uh, we have questions about time and, and how long things are going to happen and how long until maybe God moves and God works in a certain way. We've got all of these questions. Some of them are born out of anxiety. Some of them are born out of frustration. Some of them are born out of just that struggle that doesn't go away and doesn't leave us. And, and we're vexed at times. And we lack a certain peace and we lack a contentment. And there's uh, that instability of, of mind that we see with David. It's not easily addressed. It's not easily placated. His anxieties, his concerns are not easily quietened down as we see in this chapter. And so there's something we can learn from this. And I want us just to consider tonight then this idea or this subject of questions under three simple headings. The first thing to notice is that these kind of questions are inescapable. The second thought is that these questions can be very instructive for us. And the third uh, thought or heading is that such questions can be very injurious or painful. And so with God's help, we'll seek to look at uh, essentially this first verse and this idea of the, the questions that David asked. And the first thing is that questions are inescapable. David is, if we want to use this expression, he's in the center of God's will. Uh, David hasn't done anything wrong in the sense that he, he hasn't dishonored Saul. He hasn't been disloyal. He hasn't been unfaithful. He has been a good, faithful, diligent, obedient servant to the king. And so these questions that are swirling around in his mind, have I done something to upset the man? Have I done something to provoke him in this way? Something perhaps I'm not aware of. I, I'm not accustomed to being in the court. Maybe I've behaved in an inappropriate way. I've broke some protocol, whatever it may be. Have I done something wrong? These questions are swirling about in his head, but we, we can answer David's question. We can say to David, David, no. You've behaved towards Saul really impeccably. When at the very beginning in David's life, you go all the way back to the, the attitudes that were expressed to David even before he came in contact with Saul. Remember in his family, where Saul comes, or Samuel rather, comes to anoint the next king of Israel, and the attitude towards David is, oh, we wouldn't want him because it's just David, and he's just the youngest that feeds the sheep. We didn't even think to call him. But his, his response to that isn't one of spite and bitterness. He's still respectful to his father, even to his brothers, even though they discount him terribly. He doesn't show a bitter spirit towards them. He comes to the defense of Israel, not for the sake just of the nation, but for the glory of God. He's only ever tried to do the right thing. He's not there as a glory hunter. He's not there to get attention and to make something of himself. He's not after the headlines. He's not coveting the prize. He doesn't care for the reward that Saul is offering for the person that will defeat the giant. He's only interested in one thing, the glory of God, the honor of God's name and reputation for the word and the truth of God. That's all that concerns him. And that's why he took the field to fight with the giant. And he, he hasn't sought to undermine the king in any way. He's played the harp even when Saul turned against him. He's never turned against Saul. And, and yet, even though he's been doing all the things that are right, He's still vexed with these questions because of the events that have happened around him. These questions come against him. In other words, when a person is walking uprightly, when they are living before God conscientiously, they can still be vexed with these kinds of questions. What have I done? Why are the things happening in my life that are? There will still be things that we can't understand and compute. And as I, I, I said a few moments ago, 
this happens in our lives, doesn't it? It's happening at the present time in, in, in some of our lives. And it happens repeatedly. But we mustn't think that because we've got questions that we don't know the answers to and there are things that are happening that we can't figure out and make sense of that necessarily that means that we have done something wrong or that we are walking apart from God. And I trust we can see that. This is clear in David's life. He has been walking uprightly. He has covered himself in glory in that sense. And yet he's got these questions. And so it's not wrong necessarily to think or feel in this way. Uh, we could think of the Lord Jesus himself. And again, David at this point in his life with these questions in some way points again to the Lord Jesus Christ, the greater David. Because we find the Lord Jesus, do we not, in the garden of Gethsemane with the cross before him. And, and he's got, if you like, that question. If it be possible, let the cup pass. If it be possible. He's looking in the face of suffering. He's looking into that cup and he, he recognizes that in the cup of God's wrath, the cup of God's fury, remember that's a picture, it's a, a picture in the Psalms and elsewhere in the Old Testament of uh, re receiving something in a cup. It can be a cup of blessing, but it can also be a cup of uh, agony, a cup of bitterness, a cup of wrath. And he's looking into this cup and it's full of the wrath of God. And he's got the question, essentially, do I really need to drink it? If it be possible, let this cup pass. And even the perfect man had that question. Do I have to? Is it necessary? Must I go through this? That's a question that I think resonates with us at different times in our lives. Do I have to? Is it necessary? And again, what I want us to see is that to have that question in our mind, initially at least at some point, is not in itself a sinful thought to have. Questions about why and what and do I have to and how long are not altogether wrong. But there are two important facts that emerge from that scene where we see the Lord Jesus in the garden. There, there is the important lesson of submission and the important lesson of revelation. Submission because in the request, there is still the submission to God. The why question, the what question, whatever the question is, must be asked, if it's going to be asked, with respect to God being ultimately in control. That we come to this default position as we ask those questions that no matter what I think or feel, no matter how confused I am, no matter how much I don't know what's going on, we come back to this position that God does know what's going on. And whilst I might not understand and there are things I might not want to have to face, that whatever the will of God is, is good. And his will is perfect. That when God calls us to go through certain experiences, that God has not taken his hand off of our life. That God has not lost control of the situation. That con contrary to that, God is very much in control. And his hand is still firmly upon the life of his servant. And so there's that submission. Not my will, but thine be done. And there's also this thought of revelation. And I think of the Apostle Paul. And it's true of Christ as well, of course. Christ prays, if it be possible. And, and it becomes evident that it's not possible. By the way, what does that mean? That means that there's no other way to be saved. 
Jesus is saying, if it be possible, let the cup pass. There's no other way for God to be able to save a soul other than the Lord Jesus Christ drinking the cup of God's wrath. If Jesus doesn't pay for the sins of his people, if he doesn't take the punishment that you and I deserve because of our sins, there is no possibility of salvation. Either he dies for our sins and, he, and the wrath of God is poured out upon him or nobody is saved. It's not possible. And listen, I firmly believe that if it were possible, if there were some other way for souls to be saved that did not require the uh, death of the Lord Jesus Christ, if, if there was a way that salvation could be procured that did not necessitate him being uh, uh, as it were, disowned by God, pushed away by God, separated from God, if there was another way of salvation, it would have been done. But heaven was saying that, the, that salvation was not possible in any other way. And yet, the Savior stops praying. He stops asking. He stops asking because it becomes evident to him that there is no other way. Similarly, Paul praying about the thorn in his flesh. Again, was it a physical problem? Perhaps. Was it a spiritual problem? Again, perhaps. It could have been. We don't know exactly what it was. We speculate to some extent. But he prays that it would be taken from him. And when God makes it clear to him that it won't be, he stops. Now, Paul prayed three times, and then he knew. We might pray three times, and God might make it clear to us in some way that, well, that's his will that it continues. We might pray 33 times. We might pray a thousand times. We might pray the rest of our lives, because God doesn't tell us directly that it's his will that something continues. We might never know, and if God doesn't make it clear to us, then it is quite right and legitimate for us to keep asking the question, can it be taken away? But if God does reveal his purpose to us. If he makes us aware of uh, what his plan is for us, it is appropriate that we stop saying, take it away. <coughs> because we know what God desires. And so questions are inescapable. Questions are not sinful by themselves. Provided we ask them with submission to God and we ask them until such times as God would reveal to us what his will is, or if he doesn't make that clear, again, there is nothing wrong in a sense in asking the question. And so we can ask the questions e even though uh, we are living in the center of God's will, and there will be, and, and we can't avoid those as we go through life. There, there will always be those kind of questions. So questions are inescapable, but questions are also instructive. Now, sometimes... We don't learn what we need to learn because we don't know how to ask the right questions. Um, that ever happened to you? Where you find out a piece of information and you, and you say to somebody, well, uh, why didn't you tell me that? And they say, well, you didn't ask me. And you think, well, that's helpful. Uh, but sometimes we don't get the answers that we need because we don't ask the right questions. And sometimes we, we get a piece of information or we get news or whatever because we're asking the wrong questions. And sometimes people will deliberately ask questions of a certain kind in order to draw out from people uh, particular answers that they want to hear. And so that can be a kind of a, a psychological trick that people play to manipulate uh, people's thoughts, ask questions that will uh, corral their thinking in a certain direction and lead them to conclusions that uh, are not actually the right ones or the true ones. And so uh, the devil does this. Uh, the devil did it in the garden where he sows seeds of doubt in Adam and Eve's minds by saying, hath God said. So he asks a question that has a subtle, uh, subtly built in that gets them doubting God. doesn't say anything outright. But he, the way he asks it and the kind of questions that he's asking uh, has a suggestion built in that God doesn't love them, God doesn't care for them, God's actually against them, God's 
limiting them in some way and so forth. And so the questions are designed to get people to a particular conclusion. And in a sense, David uh, asks questions uh, that will lead to the wrong kind of answers. Um, he, he asks questions where he's focused on himself. What have I done? What is mine iniquity? What is my sin? Now, once he starts getting focused on himself, he's in trouble at this time in his life and in this particular way. And that doesn't detract from what I said earlier. If, if we haven't asked those questions about ourselves before God, we're trying to ignore something that's important. But speaking to the people of God, if we're walking with God and living with him, one of the things that the devil wants to do is to get us to stop looking to Christ. Now, his purpose, his ambition, and his strategy is constantly to get us to stop looking to Jesus Christ. Why? Because Christ is our life. Because Christ has died to draw us to himself. And what the devil wants to do is to separate us from God because he's trying to undo what God is doing. God draws people to himself. The devil wants to separate them. And so the devil wants us, instead of looking to Christ, his purpose is to get us to look away from Christ, to look in any direction at all. And one of the great things that he will seek to do, I don't mean great in that it's good, but one of the, the chief things that he will do is to get us to be so fixated on ourselves that we can't see Christ. We're so busy looking at ourselves and so busy looking at our own lives and so busy looking inward that we don't see Christ. And the problem is, if we look at ourselves and look at our own hearts and look at our behavior and look at everything to do with us, there's nothing there that's going to cheer your soul. There's nothing that you will see in yourself that is going to cause you to know any kind of rejoicing or joy or gladness. It's not going to fill you with hope and cheer. And the only time that it's really fitting and appropriate to see yourself is to see yourself in the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. If Christ is out of you, it is never a good time to start examining your own heart and life. Be careful that you only examine yourself, if you like, at Calvary. Examine yourself in light of the gospel. Don't see yourself purely in terms of your own sinful, darkened heart. And David's focused on himself. And therefore, we find him in this situation where he is downcast, and he is dispirited, and he is depressed, and he is discouraged, because that's all that he can see. And he's focusing in on himself. And he comes to this kind of conclusion. You see, all this bad stuff's happening. He's being pursued and hounded and hunted down by Saul. And, the, and he's starting to think now, the reason why he won't give up, the reason why he's trying to kill me is I've done something wrong. And we can understand that. We can understand that you might come to that conclusion. But you see, the problem is David uh, almost believes in karma. You know, these things are happening to me because I've done something wrong somewhere in the past. And that kind of superstitious thinking is not that unusual. In the Savior's day, there were people that came to him with a story. They came and they, they wanted to tell him this piece of news. Um, there was a building in a place called Siloam, and it, and it collapsed. And when the building collapsed, there were 18 people that died in that collapse. And in the mind of the people that were telling the story, those who died tragically like that were more sinful than the people telling the story. The reason that they died tragically and, and suddenly was because they had done something wrong. And, and perhaps this was the judgment of God. God judged them. The tar fell on them. They were sinners. And uh, then Jesus tells another story, and he talks about the Galileans. These people from the north of Israel had come down to Jerusalem to worship. They were kind of right-wing extremists. And they were people that were agitating and rebelling against Roman authority and occupation. And when they come down to Jerusalem, the, sol the Roman soldiers are lying in wait within the temple complex. And as they come to offer their sacrifices, the Romans surprise them, the ambush is sprung, and the Galileans die. And the thought in the people again is, ah, they, they, they were wicked people. They were bad people, and therefore they met with a, a bad end. They got what they deserved, you see? Uh, they had done something wrong, and therefore they died like that. 
And their thought was, we're not like that. We're not bad people like that. Therefore, we'll not die tragically like that. And the Savior's point to them was wrong. Do you think that you're different or better than they are, that they were worse than you? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You see, we, we can do that too, can't we? We can think that certain things happen to people because maybe they're bad. Uh, or sometimes we flip it on its head. People think uh, only the good die young. You ever hear that expression? They, they get this idea that somehow we lived in such a, a mixed up, perverse, twisted world that bad things only seem to happen to good people. And that, that can become a very vexing issue, can't it? The psalmist in Psalm 73 deals with that. that that's something that bothers him. It irritated him. It, it affected him deeply. Where he started then to question God. He started to question his own interest in God and his own relationship with God. Was it really worthwhile? Had he, had he made a terrible mistake? Believing in God and living as he did, trusting in God. And we can't tell, can we? We can't tell what a person's spiritual condition is in the state of their heart by looking at what's happening in their life. It doesn't follow. We look at someone like Job, and that becomes clear. Job suffers terribly. The loss of all of his wealth, the loss of all of his family, the loss of his health, the loss of the support of his wife, the loss of his friends. Everybody has turned against him. And he's alone apart from God. And people look on and say, ah, you've done something terrible. His friends tell him this. And of course, it's not true. It's wrong. And so sometimes we can ask, if you like, the wrong questions. And the question that's been asked here is a question that the disciples even asked. Remember in John chapter 9, the Lord Jesus and the disciples meet a blind man. And the disciples have a question. This man who was born blind, and the, the disciples ask a very puzzling question. I, I find it puzzling because they say, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, if he was born blind, how did he sin before he was born? Uh, so I'm not sure if they thought that one through, perhaps, or where they were coming from in their theological uh, outlook, but... You see the kind of thinking behind that question. Somebody must have sinned in order for this to happen. This must be traceable back to a particular sin, not just a sin generally, but to a particular sin, because this is where the question is almost right, you see. And even David's question is almost right. Why is David suffering as he is? Why is he faced with Saul's anger and ire? Why is he going through all that he's going through? Has he personally done some particular thing wrong? Has this man done some particular thing wrong that he's blind? Have his parents done some particular thing wrong that their child was born this way? Have I done something wrong? And you see, the problem with that thinking is that we are looking at what we have done rather than recognizing that we live in a world that is fallen. That it's not have I done one particular thing or you done one particular thing, but the question and the reality is we have all sinned. And because we have sinned collectively as humanity, not just Adam, Adam's not a distant character in history that we can lay all the blame at Adam's feet and say, well, you failed, you miserable wretch. If only God had allowed me to be made first, I would have behaved differently and I would have uh, done what God wanted me to do and, and I would have spared the world from all that has come into the world by way of the curse. Well, of course not. You were there and I was there. The Bible makes that clear. Adam did not act on our behalf with everybody else in history kicking and screaming and protesting about his foolishness, crying out, oh, no, Adam, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. No, we were all there with him saying, go ahead, Adam. Good idea. We'll disobey God. And how do we know that? Well, the evidence is in Romans 5, 12. As by one man... Sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men in that all have sinned. 
You see, all of us sin. The way we know that we have sinned is sin is punishable by death, and we can all die. From the youngest to the oldest, we can die. And that's judgment against sin, which means that we are born in sin. We're born as sinners because we already are guilty before we open our mouth, before we open our eyes, before we take a, a breath. We've already sinned. And therefore, the effect that sin has had upon this world, the curse pronounced against this world, and the curse pronounced upon God's creation, man included. We're culpable. We bear responsibility for that. So the question isn't tonight, what particular sin have I committed in terms of did I, did I do something yesterday? Did I cheat somebody? Did I act wrongly? Did I, am I being punished for some particular thing that I did? No, that's not the issue. The issue is we live in a world that is under God's judgment is under this curse of God because we have sinned. We are feeling the effects of sin. Now, again, we can end up asking the wrong question again. Because we end up asking the question, well, why does one person suffer and not everybody? The blind man in John 9, why him? Why was he affected and not somebody else? And that seems to be a legitimate question. Uh, again, it's a question I'm sure that sometimes we have thought, why, maybe you thought about it, why me? Or why somebody else in my family? Why another person that I know and love and care for? Why me and not somebody else? And of course, if we could shift things along and move it to somebody else, well, they'd be asking the same thing, wouldn't they? Uh, and, and in a sense that that's within us all, sometimes for self-preservation, sometimes because we love people, we, we wouldn't, it would be an awful dilemma to be in to say, no, you can, you can take this problem away from yourself or from somebody else by just moving it to another person. Who would you give it to? Would you want to be in that position? But you see, the question isn't so much why does one person suffer from something and somebody else doesn't. The question is, why do we all not suffer more than we do? And why is the level of suffering not greater? Because the reality is that we deserve to suffer more than we do. Because we've all sinned most heinously against a holy God. We don't deserve the mercy that we enjoy. God is more merciful to us than we deserve. And rather than protesting what does happen, we should be giving thanks to God in a sense for what hasn't happened. It's hard sometimes, admittedly, isn't it? To think that way in the midst of suffering, in the midst of hardship, but, but that is the truth. The truth is that God is merciful to us and what we deserve is greater than what we actually receive in this life. And the fact is tonight that we deserve to go straight to hell without even so much as an opportunity to hear of God's salvation. That's what we deserve as sinners. But here again is the mercy of God tonight that you have an opportunity to hear the gospel. We don't, we don't deserve that. And it's not the first time for any of us. There, there are no newcomers tonight. You're hearing the gospel yet again. And you can't say, I deserve that, or I'm entitled to that, or God owes that to me. We know that he doesn't owe it to any of us. And here's the mercy of God. So why then? Why, in the case of the man in, in John 9, and, and even here with David, why? Well, the Lord Jesus in John 9 answers that question very, very clearly. So the disciples asked a question, and Jesus said this, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. He is as he is, not because of some particular sin or wrongdoing. He's like this because God is going to be revealed in his situation. And Jesus will go on to heal this man. And in the healing of him, 
he's revealing himself. And this man that ends up being healed of his blindness will go on to testify that Jesus Christ is a great prophet, that he, he, he isn't what the Pharisees claim him to be. They claim him to be a great sinner. Why? Because he made somebody better on the Sabbath day. You couldn't be more sinful than that, was their thought. And the man had more theology in his wee toe than most Pharisees had uh, <laughs> gathered together with all the degrees and so-called learning. Because he said, hold on a minute, fellas. That doesn't make any sense. If he was a sinner, he couldn't do the works of God. If he is what you're claiming him to be, God wouldn't work through him. He has to be a great man of God. He didn't fully realize who he was. He thought he was a great prophet. The Lord Jesus will reveal himself to this man and, and tell him and show him that he is the son of God, that he is the Messiah, the sent one. He's revealed. Christ is revealed. Now, in, in, in David's life, again, what are we seeing? Th these things are happening to David. And what have we been noticing in the life of David? His life reveals Christ. His life is a type of Christ. It's a shadow. We look at David's life and we see that, it, in a sense, it mirrors the life of Christ. It's pointing forward to the greater David. And not only does it do that by way of a, a, a sort of an illustration, but ultimately, the Lord Jesus Christ, in terms of his humanity, is going to come into this world from the family of David. Christ is going to be revealed. That's the purpose of David's suffering. Why is he experiencing this? Because his life is revealing Christ. Why would the Lord allow any of us to suffer anything? So that Christ would be revealed in us. That Christ in his grace would be made manifest to us and also through us so that other people would see it as well. And that leads us inevitably to this third thought quickly. That questions are sometimes injurious. And, and by that I mean David's in this awful position where he, he's asking the question, what have I done wrong? But I think he knows in the back of his mind that he hasn't done anything wrong. And so it's that horrible why question. I haven't done anything wrong. So why me? And there is no harder thing to bear, is there, than suffering when you know you haven't done anything wrong. When you know that you are being victimized by someone who is ruthless, callous, just mean. When somebody is uh, taking what they deserve and somehow they're twisting things around and they lay the guilt on you and you end up suffering for their wrongdoing. We feel a, a deep sense of injustice at that and we want to cry out that it's not fair. And at times that's how we feel. And we want to cry out, it's not fair. But again, it points us to Christ, doesn't it? Because the greatest expression of a sense of unfairness was uttered by the Lord Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why? Why hast thou forsaken And there's a mystery in that, in those moments in Christ's life. There's a mystery in that aspect of Christ as the God-man. But there's something, if you like, that doesn't compute there, even for, for the Savior. The humanity, the man Christ Jesus is, is asking a valid question, why? He who has done no sin, he who has done nothing wrong, he's asking the question, why? Have I been pursued by the wrath of God? Why has God turned his back on me when all that I have ever done is to please him? Why is God abandoning me now when previously he has said, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Why would God abandon me now when I have done everything to please him? And there's an agony in there. 
there's an agony and a distress of mind. Why? There's something glorious in that statement too, though. There's something that we can draw from that. Because we know why. We know why. The sins of Christ's people, those people that they died for, they are being laid upon him. He has been made the object of God's wrath because sins are brought and laid upon his back. And he bore our sins on his own body in the tree, Peter says. But Jesus said, why? Did he not know that sins were being laid on him? It tells us this, that even though sin was laid upon him, the sin did not make him sinful. What do I mean? When you sin, you know about it. Your conscience accuses you. You feel guilty. You know that you've done wrong. As much as you try to ignore it, hide from it, mask it over, dull your conscience, all the rest of it, we know that we've done wrong. We know that somewhere in the past we've done wrong. We know about right and wrong. The Lord Jesus has the sins of his people laid upon him, and yet he doesn't have that consciousness that he has sinned. His conscience is still clear. In his mind, he has not sinned because he hasn't sinned. His memory does not have memories of sin because he hasn't sinned in the past. His conscience isn't smiting him now because he hasn't sinned in the present. And he asks the question, why? Because he still has done nothing wrong, even though all the sins of his people are laid upon him. So that in the eyes of God, Nobody has ever been more sinful. Nobody has ever borne more sin before God than Jesus Christ. And yet he himself still remains pure and spotless. And, and so this sense of injustice, as we look at it, it's there. Why? Why have I been forsaken? And yet we know the answer to that. That Jesus Christ experienced that, that sense, that feeling of injustice so that you and I wouldn't have to feel that or know that. So that we wouldn't have to feel or know the experience of justice. He was separated from God's mercy and God's love and God's grace so that we wouldn't ever have to be. You see, if you die in your sin, you're going to go to hell. And what is hell? Hell isn't somewhere that God isn't. People have this idea that hell is the devil's domain and God's in heaven and the devil's in hell. God's in hell. God created hell for the punishment of sinners and the punishment of the devil and his angels. What's the difference between heaven and hell? It's not that God's in one and not in the other. The difference is this. In heaven, what you have expressed is God's love, God's mercy, God's grace, God's compassion. And what's absent in heaven is God's justice, if you like, his wrath against sin. That's not there. It doesn't need to be there because there's no sin to be angry against. There's no sin to be punished there. So it's, it's all of the, the, the lovely, if you like, aspects of God, all of these things that delight our soul, they're all in heaven to their full extent. But in hell, there's no love. There's no mercy. There's no grace. It's just God's righteous anger. It's God's wrath. It's God's fury poured out against those who hold on to their sin. It's justice. And the Lord Jesus expressed that sense of injustice to spare us from God's justice. David says, why me? And in our lives, there are times when we suffer in one way or another. Sometimes it's because we're doing the right thing. And the scripture reminds us that all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Just remember what Peter says in closing, child of God. He said that if we're going to suffer, and we will, essentially he says, make sure that you suffer as a righteous person because you're doing the right thing. Make sure that you are not suffering because you're a busybody or an evildoer or a liar or a murderer or a thief or an adulterer. 
If you're going to suffer and you will, make sure it's for the right reasons. Suffer for the sake of Christ. Now, how does that do anything for us? Because Peter says, if you do suffer for righteousness sake, if you suffer for Christ's sake, happy are ye. Of course, that's the first thing we think when we suffer. We, we think about being happy, don't we? Not normally. But if we stop to think about our sufferings for Christ's sake, we can be happy. How? Because it shows, as Peter says, that we have been given the Spirit of God. If we suffer for righteousness' sake, if we suffer for Christ's sake, it shows that we have been born again of His Spirit, that we have been made partakers of the divine nature. It's a witness to ourselves that we really belong to Him. Because nobody who does not belong to Christ, nobody who is outside of Christ suffers for righteousness' sake. That's just a fact. At times it might appear that they do, but they do not. They do not suffer for Christ. Only those who belong to Jesus Christ can and will suffer for Jesus Christ. Nobody else can or will. If you're suffering because you're doing the right thing in God's sight, if you're suffering for righteousness' sake, if you're suffering for the sake of Jesus Christ, Rest assured in this. It is because the Spirit of God rests upon you. That should be a comfort to your own soul. You can be happy in that knowledge. You can rejoice in this further, that Christ is being seen in your life, in your sufferings. As you suffer, and with God's grace, you patiently endure the suffering. As you take the suffering and you give thanks to God and you rest in God and you rely upon Him and you and others see the grace of God that sustains and upholds you, who or what is being revealed in your life? Christ is being seen in your life. It's not you that is being seen. It's God. It's the glory of His grace that has been demonstrated. Your life's like a billboard and it's advertising the wondrous grace of God. People can see Christ demonstrated in your life and your life reveals the gospel. Again, it's a further comfort to your own soul because again, as you take that suffering patiently, it shows obedience to Christ. That you're obedient to Him and to His commands. That rather than trying to find a way out, rather than rebelling against it, you're faithful to him. And again, that should be of comfort to your own soul that obedience is a mark of belonging to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so David has these questions. Questions that he can't escape, nor can we. There will always be questions. They are questions that are instructive because they remind us not that we have done something particular, or one individual sin on one particular day of our lives, but they remind us that we are sinners and we live in a world that is cursed because of our sin. But we also recognize that these questions in connection with our sufferings point us to Christ, to consider him and his sufferings. And as we feel a sense of injustice and we cry out, why, what have I done? Let us remember what Christ has done. And let us take refuge in him. And if you are being persecuted for righteousness sake, rejoice tonight. Happy are ye. Blessed are ye when ye are persecuted for righteousness sake. May God help us to take our questions to another. Our time is well gone, but notice where they take in your own time, where do they lead David to? They lead him to someone who points him to God. They lead him to one who will say, the Lord be with thee as he has been with my father. Someone says to him, David, I maybe can't answer all your questions. I can try and reassure you as best I can, and Jonathan did, but ultimately he said, God is with you. Fear not. Do not be afraid. May God teach us to look to him and may we point one another to the one who is able to keep us from falling.
May God bless his truth to our hearts tonight, for his name's sake. Amen.